Um, there were four, four criteria. One of them was the existence of advanced education and training. Another was the establishment of standards of practice and certification, an agreed upon theoretical and empirical base, and then work of individuals in the field to act as advocates for the profession. And in fact, we then, we at the time, the board at the time, were using those to then try and flesh out and, and look to, to see uh, the extent to which TESOL, both the association and the profession, were working towards these standards. So on the next slide, and I, I looked at the, um, when I, in the article, I, I did a, you know, the devil's advocate and then the, you know, the argument for and the argument against. Um, and the argument against, I pointed out that uh, individuals with minimum or no training whatsoever are able to practice as T-cell teachers, the only qualification being their status as being native speakers of the language. Um, I'd also quoted Don Freeman, who said that one of the things about our field was that there was no agreed, that there was no, there was no agreed upon disciplinary base or rules of the game. Um, and I'll come back and talk about that in a minute as well. Um, there are individuals whose ignorance of the field is cosmic, Caspar Weinberger being one of them, and able to make get headline get headlines in the newspapers while we struggle to do so. Um, making pronouncements on issues to do with language education, such as the virtues of Proposition 227. And then in contrast, we have very little power or influence over public opinion. So then I then, I then posed the opposite case, and then the conclusion that I came to, which is on the next slide, was that it depends... Oh, sorry, no, let, let me now come back to... Um, advocacy for the for the field and the uh, th this this research that Weinberger argued was uh, in, uh, showed showed the fallacy of the of bilingual education and the advantages of English only. Um, I actually went back and looked at the uh, looked at what the researchers had actually said in this follow up study, and here's a quote from the the research report that a study. Uh, released today found that 63 schools with bilingual education programs, these are the ones that have been given exemptions, by the way, did better on tests of academic achievement in English than over a thousand similar schools who had gone over to the, uh, the Proposition 227. And so how do we reconcile these? So again, um, these days, everybody has to, you know, everything has to be evidence-based unless it's you know, arguing for climate change and uh, the fact that Australia doesn't exist. It, it, very interesting, just as an aside, did you know that uh, people who don't believe in climate change and don't believe in vaccinations also don't believe that Australia, Australia where I was born and spent a fair bit of my early years actually exists? Um, so again, evidence-based, it depends on the evidence. I then went back to the Weinberger article and saw that the, 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 the schools that he was citing included those in fairly privileged areas such as Riverside in Southern California and also Santa Monica Community College. And so therefore, again, if you look at the, look at the literature, you find that the, the database was very, very much skewed. So then I think the next slide shows the the conclusion that I came that I came to at the end. This is you know, going back twenty years ago. That uh, in answering the question, it depends on where you look. That you can find schools where the only quali qualification for being employed as a teacher is to uh, be a native speaker of the language. That uh, um, there is there's very little in the way of advanced education and training. That uh, people who uh, have absolutely no qualifications to do so think that they can make, make pronouncements about what we do and so on. But I said, uh, there's, it's also the case that there are institutions, associations, schools around the world that ad adhere to the highest uh, standards of advanced education and training, lifelong professional development, um, work to develop standards, standards of certification, uh, to develop uh, theory and research and so on and so forth. 
And so I use that as a framing device in a, in a paper I've, I've, um, I, I've got coming out next year. It's the, it's the lead paper in the, of in Ellie Hinkle's Handbook of Research on uh, language teaching and research. And she kindly asked me to write this lead article and, and, I, and I called it Changing Landscapes. And I went, went back and looked at, uh, looked at the uh, original paper and then looked at how far we'd come in the last 20 years. Okay, um, any comments from my fabulous I'll throw in a comment or a question. So yeah. since since you wrote this article, do you feel like um, TESOL as an organization has made um, decent progress in its advocacy efforts? Watch this space. <laughs> I'm going to actually come onto that question, but uh, again, the answer is up to a point, Lord Copper. Um, and that, and that was that was an issue that was one of the major one of the major issues that uh, that emerged during our TESOL summit. And as I say, when I when I when I run through the priority areas that the uh, with the outcomes of the summit, um, I'll address that particular question. Okay. Are there any other questions? There they've been very quiet in the chat box, David. I feel like I'm chiding. I feel more asleep already, have I? <laughs> so maybe, maybe we'll encourage them to talk. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe too, they just want to hear your wisdom. So, okay, let's go on. So, one of the things that I address in this chapter that I'm I've been working on is looking at this notion of, of change. Um, and one of my great heroes, Jerome Bruner, when I was a grad student in the UK in the mid seventies, I had the great uh, good fortune to take some classes with Bruner. He had taken, um, he'd taken leave from Harvard and uh, moved to Oxford in the UK to work with them on developing their curriculum. And uh, he was a tremendous visionary. So over 50 years ago, he said that given the information explosion, it should be self-evident that each generation must define afresh the nature, direction, and aims of education to assure such freedom and rationality as can be attained for a future generation. If he, given his bemusement at the pace of change <laughs> over 50 years ago, if he, if you're alive today, he only died a couple of years ago, um, and he was working right right up until that time. He was 99 years of age, I think. But um, I just wonder what what uh, what he was thinking at the time about the pace of change. But again, he said that the focus of the classroom should be on the learner, not the teacher. And what we need is more learning, uh, less teaching. Another person who influenced me, and again, somebody I had uh, some classes from was Lawrence Stenhouse, again, back in the 1970s when I was a graduate student. And he talked about the inherent cons uh, conservatism of, of education. He said that a rule of thumb is that a significant innovation generally takes about 30 years to get into the bloodstream of an, of a, of an institution. And I was just thinking recently, in the mid 80s, I got interested in the whole concept of task and project based learning. And I eventually published a book called Designing Tasks for the Communicative Classroom, which came out in about um, 1989. So it's almost 30 years later and still people, I overhear people at conferences saying, yeah, but what is a task? What's this task-based stuff all about? So that's kind of bearing out Stenhouse's, uh, um, Stenhouse's observation. So we go on and look at this, this pace of change on the next slide. And again, another person who some of you may know, he's, uh, this, is, this is a quote from a, from a turf talk, uh, not a turf talk, I'm <laughs> bringing in turf too quickly, a TED talk. And... Uh, Ken Robinson said that um, the, uh, we, have a, we have a huge vested interest in education. And he said at the time that um, no, we don't know what the world is going to be like in five years time. And so what kind of curricula can we, who are responsible for curriculum development and change, what sort of curricula 
can we devise which are going to be appropriate for learners uh, who were born now? Um, we don't know what the world is going to be like in five years' time. He said, I would say, and think back on the last 18 months, we had no idea 18 months ago <laughs> what the world in, in 2021 was going to be like. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I've got various grandkids in different parts of the world. Um, I think they're mine. But a uh, daughter who lives in the UK has had, had her third child about almost two years ago. And I haven't, I've yet to, apart from FaceTime, I've yet to set eyes on, on my, my latest uh, grandkid. But he's going to be graduating from um, school and looking for um, either employment or higher education in 20 years' time. And so what sort of, what sort of curriculum is going to be appropriate, uh, appropriate for him? And again, uh, the, the notion is that we, we, we must move beyond the transmission of in, information, which is going to be irrelevant, much of it's going to be irrelevant uh, in 20 years' time, and look at the mastery of, of, of content. Um, so let's go on and let's go on to the next slide. Um, and so this is this has led to this uh, this movement that's been going on for um, for quite a while now, for about twenty five years. The the competency based um, uh, curriculum for competencies for the twenty first century. Um, we're almost a quarter of the way through the century, and uh, so but we're still talking about which com what competencies do we need. Um, and there have been many, many proposals for the kinds of competencies. One of the ones that um, that I like looks divides up competencies into cognitive, interpersonal, and intrapersonal competencies. And you can see that they're focusing on skills and strategies rather than content. Although, in terms of cognitive strategies, they they do say that there's a place for mathematics, science, and so on. Although. The, the kinds of mathematics and the kinds of science that we're going to be we're going to be addressing in 20 years' time will be very different. Uh, and then, in terms of, of interpersonal, we've got uh, things such as communication, collaboration, leadership, global awareness, and so on. And then, intrapersonal learning how to learn, self-evaluation, autonomy. And one of the drivers of this particular movement has actually been politicians and and the business community, who've argued that the kinds of uh, the kinds of learners who are graduating from, from our schools and universities, uh, their knowledge and skills is obsolete. And, the, and they, they have been really getting behind this notion of uh, education for, um, in terms of developing competencies and so that individuals have the flexibility and the skills to con constantly, regardless of the academic or um, professional areas they're working on can continually update. They've got the, the, the skills to, to update their knowledge and so on. Um, I happen to be on one of the other things that I do, other hats that I wear is I'm on the foundation board of one of Australia's largest universities. It's a technologically oriented university, although it's a comprehensive one called the University of New South Wales or UNSW. And I get to meet uh, people right across the right across the board. Uh, it's not a particularly large university by some global standards. They have about seventy thousand students, but um, and campuses in different places. But it's very interesting to me to talk to uh, leaders in you know like the deans in faculties of engineering and law and so on, and they talk they talk to me about how uh, technology has really and, and the knowledge explosion has ch changed the very nature of what they do when they're educating, for example, engineers. Pointless giving uh, engineers these days slide rules and telling them to calculate weight loads and bearing loads for, uh, for steel beams because with the, with the push of a button, they can get that calculation done for them. Kate, comments? I, you know, recently uh, was surprised um, by some of the content my, my daughter's classes have been learning in high school. One of them was putting area codes onto a map. And I thought that was kind of an interesting approach, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I'm seeing a lot of this happening in the school still. And I think that the educators are doing what they, what was necessary when, or what was done when they were students or what they were learning when they were growing up. And so 
as a result, I think that they're not thinking of the current or the future. I think they're thinking they're reflecting on the past to choose some of their content. And I was wondering if that's what you what reason you think that they that folks do that. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, by the way, I, this is this is actually club soda. It's not Stolich Neue, so <laughs> I wish it were sometimes. Oh, I'm so glad you told us that. I was concerned. Yeah. It's, all, <laughs> it's almost cocktail time for you. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but I want to say I will buy you a cocktail at the next T-Cell conference for all the fiasco with the time zone difference. I think you, I think you actually owe me one. So, <laughs> okay, more than likely. <laughs> Moving right along. Well, there are no other comments or questions, so I will hit the other slide. How's that okay. for you? Um, so another point that um, that I make is I argue for the centrality of language into these to, to these competencies. That language is essential to all of these all of these competencies, and I've, I've listed some examples there. And I'm using language in its broadest sense. I mean, some of it might be self-talk. You know, we might be using self-talk or whatever. Uh, but you, you cannot, you cannot, all, fundamental to all of these competencies is, is language. Um, and I then, I then talk about the notion of language as an empty subject. And what do I mean by this? And um, what I mean is, look, looked at from one point of view, uh, language is a, unlike other subjects in the curriculum, such as biology and uh, mathematics and so on, there's no kind of content based, you know, language is a, language is a, a tool and a set of skills for talking about other things, you know, so where does the content come from? Well, it can come from, you know, in general English courses, everyday life or in content based instruction from other subjects on the, on the school or college curriculum and so on. And so I've argued, I've argued in this, in this slide that, that from this point of view, language is a, is a kind of parasite. Um, and uh, that's what, that's what makes it in some ways different from other other subjects. Any comments, challenges? It's a nice metaphor, David, um, because uh, really to get to the nature of of what is language, so we can focus on you know what what are we trying to teach here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to look at the, the content of, of the messages, as well as, um, you know, the forms of the messages. And I, and I want to just put a shout out to uh, Diane Larson Freeman, who happens to be here, who is my hero of grammaring. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it really reminds us of the content, the form and the usage, um, yeah. because language will pick up that, that, that content, the form, meaning and usage, sorry. Yeah. And we'll pick up the content. Years, years ago, uh, Diane and I did, uh, do you remember that talk we did, Diane, years ago, Grammaring and Gardening? Because I, 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 yes. I developed this organic metaphor. And then, of course, you know, this is, this is very much, uh, um, I'd be very much influenced by Diane's using that. But uh, do you remember that, Diane? We were sure I do. Room, sure I do. We, we were put in sure. a room that contained about 30 people and there were 1,500 people turned up. Yes. So they had to move <laughs> to the ballroom. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do remember that, David. I, yeah. I guess if you're asking, now that you've called me out, I got to say something, right? So um, the only thing I'm thinking about is now why you call it a parasite, because- It's a I'm, nasty metaphor, actually. <laughs> that is nasty. I, Kate said it was a good metaphor, but I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, language is- for Yeah, when I, when I saw it up there on the big screen, I thought, hmm. Maybe. So, so why did you choose parasite rather than it's a vehicle for thinking? It's a vehicle for everything else, right? Isn't yeah, that, yeah. I'm not sure. Vehicle okay, is, is a great I'll change, word I'll, either. I'll change but... it before the chapter comes out when I get it back from the editor. <laughs> Adam, well, coming back to this point, when I set up the uh, at Hong Kong U in the early '90s, I set up what's now the Center for Applied English Studies, and so all of the so we taught every undergraduate you know across all faculties and um so obviously we <clears throat> we drew on the content so if it was the english for science course we draw on we, we take a one of the one of the subjects from the science if, if it were law we we drew our content from tort law it's t-o-r-t not t-a-u-g-h-t mm -hmm. 
Um, and I was having constant battles with the deans. You know, the dean of the dean of law would call me in and, and say, "Look, what your job is to teach the students uh, the grammar and vocabulary, so we can get on with the real job." And you know, to try this notion that uh, that you're not going to get very far if you. I mean, that's the big. That's that was the problem, and it still is in many ways. The fact that you teach um, grammar grammar in in a vacuum in a contextless vacuum. Sure. Uh, and learners at all levels can't see the point. You know, when you introduce, if you introduce, for example, the passive voice simply as another way of use of, 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 of making saying the same thing as you'd say in active voice situations without invoking uh, Diane's tripartite uh, model, then the learners can't see the point. They think that you've got this other grammar piece of grammar that's of no use whatsoever because it's uh, saying essentially the same thing. Mm. Yeah. I was thinking it, it was a good metaphor because um, when I'm working with language, future language teachers, future um, K through 12 um, general educators, they often can't see the language of the content and they don't really understand the, the linguistics of it. So they, you know, to try to kind of communicate that to them, the role of language and learning, and I think language is the center of all learning. And so I'm always advocating for that, but um, they have a really hard time separating the content from the language in order to be able to analyze either one of them. Mm -hmm. um, they're so um, conflated for them. So that's why I'm like, well, maybe this is a way as a vehicle for them to see it as a means to look at the content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think there's often a conflation between language and vocabulary too, uh -huh. right? That's, uh -huh. that's how language is conceived. Yes. By someone who hasn't been trained in that. I was just saying why parasite because that's <laughs> negative. That was my- Oh, it is negative. When in fact, language is what you just said. Language, David, is yeah. central, right? So, yeah, there, are, there are some so, parasites that are, that are, that are, that are, certain, that are healthy parasites that come, come into our body and clean up the mess. <laughs> putting well, inappropriate foods into our system. I want to uh, let you know, David, there are some interesting comments. Deborah Healy um, mentioned that uh, Lori Anderson wrote um, language is a virus a number of years ago. And mm. so there, that's out there. Um, Shelley mentioned Wolf's uh, 2006 uh, comment that language is not everything in education, but without language, everything is nothing in education. And that really is a wonderful quote. Yeah. And Richard chimed in with, Richard uh, Boynum uh, chimed in with, re regarding the centrality of language to 21st century uh, education, more important than ever in inter the interconnected world uh, where translation can be obtained at the flick of a button, but that leaves um, out, of, out of all the other components of language for interpersonal, cultural, et cetera. So, you know, the fact that um, because people can translate relatively easily now, they're not going to the purposes of learning, to the process of learning another language, or they don't see the value in it as much, and they're losing other aspects of other positive outcomes of learning a language. Is that it, Richard? Did I kind of summarize it okay for you? I hope I brought it to life for you a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, ex exactly. I'll just let it let it rest there. I think you know it, it, there's just so much more than Google Translate that we all have to be <laughs> engaged with. Yes, yes, it really. And trying to yeah. advocate for the learning of other languages right now is another part of our advocacy role, right? Yeah, good one. Uh, Deborah Myhill, um, who works in the UK and works with L, mainly with L1 learners, but she argues and she, she picks up on something that one of my other former teachers uh, at the University of Exeter, Richard Pring, made was that um, uh, we tend we tend to focus on we tend to focus on on utilitarianism, you know, particularly those people who say that the form, the value the the, the point of edu education is to provide worker bees for uh, for industry, but uh, he draws a distinction between uh, usefulness and, and value. And, and Deborah also makes the, this point um, where she says that um, uh, she, she argues the case for uh, language learning, both learning about one's own language and also learning second languages, but uh, the value of learning something for its own sake. 
Um, and one of the one of the other points that I address in, in this this paper that I've got coming out, this chapter that I've got coming coming out, is that um, the uh, one of the problems that that I'm striking, and I'm doing I'm doing guest lecturing in various other now that I'm semi-retired, but uh, do guest um, courses with MA with MTSOL and MTeach students in various other various parts of the world, and uh, one of the things that um, is a, is a real problem and a challenge, and they recognise it themselves, is that they, many of them get admitted, particularly, say, in the MTeach, where they have a major, say, they might be teaching um, science uh, or, uh, and, and TESOL, have a, uh, you know, have a, or an additional language um, as, their, as their other teaching area. Uh, many of them know, because, because we no longer... Uh, many school systems in different parts of the world, I'm talking about places such as Australia and the UK, uh, people, don't, people don't learn, don't have a systematic introduction to language. And again, Deborah argues that we don't go back to the old kind of parsing and analysis thing, although it didn't do me any harm. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I knew when, I, you know, when a teacher was correcting me and saying, well, you know, the problem, Noonan, the problem about this particular sentence is if you don't have a finite verb, I knew exactly what she meant and I knew how to fix it up. But um, so, again, I, I, I kind of buy this argument of, of, of Deborah's that, that uh, we need to think about the value of something rather than just its utilitarianism. And who knows, you know, somebody who is introduced, systematically introduced to language of an appropriate kind, um, not, the, not the kind of decontextualised stuff that, that we did in the 60s, um, that, uh, that they may end up in one of these programs and they may find that um, it, it's a good thing. It's not only a useful thing, but it's it not only has value, but it has use. Better, better move on. We're... All right, so I've got to move, move this, these annoying little screens around. <laughs> so, um, Coming to the TESOL, TESOL somewhat on the future of the profession. So I don't, as I say, I don't know how many of the people in the audience actually attended this, but I'm, I know that Deborah, because she and I were sharing a table, I think, at one point. And so she will pick me up if I um, if, if I missed speak. But there were um, the, the whole project itself was quite a big one. Um, uh, I was on the steering committee that uh, that Denise Murray. Uh, chaired and we worked for two years prior to the actual uh, physical event in Athens and um, set up websites and it was very much attempt to be a, a kind of a bottom-up approach you know the web website was set up our keynote speakers posted uh, stimul uh, stimulus questions and so on and and so by the time the, the the summit started we already had a huge repository of, of data and then during the during the summit uh, all of the discussion sessions were recorded the plenaries were, uh, were recorded and so on. And then following the summit, the steering committee then had to make sense of this massive amount of data. And we had to do it, uh, the summit was in February and by, by June or July, we had to meet back in Alexandria. And um, then, no, we didn't, we met in at Cal, I think it was. Anyway, somewhere. <laughs> it's all a bit head spinning to me, looking back at the amount of traveling I used to do in those days, but anyway, we came up with this TESOL agenda, action agenda, and, and it was it was based on these five five priority areas. And I, I'll I'll touch briefly on each of these. And there, there were too many points related to each of these, so I'm only going to highlight. Uh, I've summarised some of the main points, but I, I've, I'm just going to highlight uh, one or two points that I think of, of of are important. So if we go into priority number one strengthening the status and visibility of the profession. This ties back into the point that I made in that little paper I wrote, wrote 20 years ago about the fact that uh, it was people who had political clout but whose ignorance of the subject uh, was, was pretty cosmic who were able to have their voices heard and, uh, and we as a profession didn't. So if we can go on to the next slide, please, Kate. Um, so 
the point made, one of the points that was made was there was an explosion in the demand for the AL in, in diverse global, diverse global contexts, and that um, English could could no longer be seen as the pr preserve of the the, the countries that had uh, um, from which it had emanated. Um, we noted the increasing profession, professionalisation and also the fact that uh, T-cell as a profession was consist consistently ignored. And so coming back to the question that was posed earlier on in the presentation about have we made progress here, we've made a little progress, but not nearly, not nearly enough. Um, we also noted the, 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 the private sector. There's this tendency for, for the private sector to see English as a commodity, commodity to be sold in different parts of the world rather than a resource for global communication. And then the final point was this notion of the myth of native speakerism, you know, that, that, uh, that all one needs is to be a native speaker of the language to be able to, to teach the language. And uh, so one could point out the fact that not all native speakers are actually all that competent in the language. And in fact, uh, some, some, some are, uh, well, in fact, look at, look at literacy, literacy rates, the, the number of functional, functional illiterates in uh, so-called uh, advanced uh, societies. And I certainly know the, the data from Australia is not all altogether um, reassuring. Um, Diane, I think it was the IATEPL conference where you spoke on, um, where you gave one of the plenaries that um, there was a plenary given by a non-native speaker of English. And, um, and, she, and she made a very powerful case for the fact that that was reiterated at the summit that- um, Yeah, she that, brought the house down. She was yeah, a great speaker, fabulous. a great speaker. In fact, yeah. in fact, she overshadowed all of the rest of us, I thought. Oh, I thought you were pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> One can't say that about oneself, but she was terrific. I mean, she, yeah, she was. was yeah. And, yeah. yeah, but again, she made the point that of all the criteria and measures that we need when thinking about employing uh, people who needed, I mean, obviously appropriate and advanced education and training, um, um, experience and competence in the language uh, were important, but uh, native speakerism shouldn't be one of the should should not be one of the, the criteria and measures for deciding on who gets to wear a badge called I'm a, a teacher of English or any other language. Time's running by. Okay, please, priority number two. Um, again, the this 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 actually um, was engendered a great deal of discussion, the notion that um, the, the challenging the English only uh, movement, certainly when I trained as a teacher many years ago, uh, using the learner's first language was a complete no-no. Um, but in recent years, this, this has been challenged and there's been uh, quite a bit of research which shows, which demonstrates that, um, for example, Fred Genesee um, from Montreal, uh, his, his paper uh, argues and provides evidence to show that the learner's most valuable resource in learning a second language is their first language. Um, various, other, um, various other studies that I've cited here, uh, for example, Jim Cummins, is, um, who argues that particularly when learners are working, coming in and say studying in say an, an ESL context, for example, uh, and they're having to master uh, content areas to you know, do, do science and history and mathematics and so on, that they can use the, the content knowledge that they have developed in their first, their first language um, to facilitate uh, learning and mastering content in their second language. But as I say, this, this, this raised a, a fair degree of, of, of controversy and again, uh, Lee, Professor Leeway from University of London um, was one of the speakers, and he's been one of the major researchers in the areas of trans and translanguaging and, and plurilingualism. Um, and uh, but this raised a number of objections. I mean, there were some there were some uh, people who ran large private schools, for example, who said, "Well, yes, I, I accept all this, but if we don't." If I, if, I, if I challenge this, I'll get fired. 
well, the parents just won't send their kids along because they want, first of all, they want native speakers and they want, uh, they want an exclusive uh, English only in the classroom. Again, it uh, probably depends very much on the, on the massive, as a point that I touched on earlier, is this massive diversification and fragmentation of, of how, where and when uh, English is being taught in different parts of the world, that it's almost impossible to make one kind of universal general statement about, uh, about any particular aspect. Let me move on, please. Um, Deborah wants to make a comment. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, so one of the things that I really appreciated about the summit that speaks both to your previous point and this one is that you actually had Ministry of Education people there. Sure. And talking to teachers in most countries doesn't do much good. But at, at our table, I know the, the guy from the ministry was very much affected by the idea that you could be a non-native speaker and be highly qualified and very good. So I think that was a really big part of it for me, seeing the right people in the room. And that was one of the major aims of the, of the, of the summit. You know, we, we were saying, well, we were always talking to, we we're always talking to ourselves and we all basically agree, but, but if we want to effect change, we've got to get people who can actually do something about making, bring, making these differences. And, Again, there was a lot of thought that went into the discussion tables. We tried as far as possible to have, say, a teacher, educator, a researcher, um, a ministry official, um, a bureaucrat, and so on at each of the tables. You know, we want access to the politicians, the, these people who are making these decisions, you know, um, that influence all of us. And it's so hard to get at them in other ways. So it's great that they came to the table for mm. this. One of one of my one of the another terrific presentation uh, was the one that Misty Adenu gave one of my fellow country people from Australia and she said and one of her strategies and she's very political she she works in in Canberra and so on and so she she can see close up uh, the way that uh, politicians work you know we don't have a beltway but within the metaphorical beltway and she said she argued what. Well, one of her strategies was to work on teachers and get get involved in parent teacher associations. And if an, if a proposition came up that was um, uh, that, that they thought was um, the profession thought was antithetical to the the, the quality of education, um, they would actually go along and they talk to parents and um, even give them talking points and would say, "We'll go back and talk to your politicians." And Misty's comment was, "Well, politicians don't." don't talk to us, but they talk to parents because parents get them elected or get them unelected. And so that was one of the strategies that she employed to, uh, to effect change or attempt to effect change with those who are policy makers and people who are in positions of power. Okay, moving on. So this is a, this is a two, two slide issue. And again, um, it reinforces another of the points that I touched on all those years ago, that, um, and, and it's reflected in one of the other slides as well, that, that English, English teaching and learning can no longer be seen uh, as isolated from, seen as isolated siloized subjects on the curriculum that you do from you know after lunch when most kids are tired and you want to sleep um, and another point that i've already made that an additional language is well placed to develop these 21st century competencies and there's a quote here from sarah mercer who's who's written some very interesting stuff on the notion of of well-being and um uh and particularly in the over the last couple of years, the the massive um, impact that uh, think lockdowns and school closures and so on has had on the psychological well-being of uh, kids, but also uh, other people as well. And um, I've highlighted here this this point that uh, education, as as language educators, we need to see that we have to do we have we have to define what we do much more than the narrowly defined uh, notion of linguistic competence, although that's obviously very important. It's not the only thing that needs to be involved in the, the development of the whole child. This slide continues, th this point continues on the next slide. 
Um, and so here we here we focused here we focused on the um, issues of equity, social justice, and so on. And so uh, the summit concluded that uh, significant advantages accrue to those who are competent in in other languages and uh, as it's used for international com com communication, but access to quality education is is not available to all. Um, if I can just digress and tell a, an anecdote, when I finally graduated from uh, my postgrad degrees in the UK, and then I taught for a couple of years, but I wanted to get back to back to Asia and back to uh, um, contexts that I, I knew. So I got a position at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, and um, that was an elite school. Obviously, it was, was founded by King Chulalongkorn. Um, and so the students were 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 privileged. Uh, a lot of the courses were they were they were already even though this is still the seventies they were beginning to um, have courses that drew their content from from the uh, other courses in the in the curriculum. Um, and as an aside, one of my one of the one of the students in my course was um, was the, was the, um, uh, the princess the princess royal. <laughs> And uh, she, it was her great grandfather who'd established this university, and so, so here you had um, you had a very privileged elite on the way from the uh, across the street where where we had our where we had the language centre uh, from the main campus. There was a, there was a large compound of workers from the northeast who were uh, had come down to Bangkok to work as labourers and who lived in these lived in these slums. Um, and had no access to education, and it was kind of I, I just found it so striking. You had this very elite university, and, and these people who who would never have an opportunity to learn to learn the language. Um, one summer, uh, sorry, one at one at one Christmas period when the university was on vacation, I took a job as a volunteer with uh, the UNHCR. At this time, Vietnam had invaded Cambodia, and and, and there were thousands and thousands of Cambodians who'd been forced over the um, over the over the border into into Thailand and uh, so that was something that changed my life it was just the most uh, unbelievable experience uh, the, the poverty and the uh, the first the first thing we had to do every morning was to go through the camp we had 30,000 people in about a 30 acre Square and they were living. They were, they were given bits of plastic sheeting. You know the stuff they put that under concrete when they're pouring concrete. That was and they had to construct. And then they were given uh, twigs to light fires and and some rice. And the first thing we had to do each morning, first thing we had to do was to give blood. I remember the first day I arrived there and I said, "What what, what do you want?" And <laughs> the UNHCR guy said, "We want your blood." You know this is crucial. But the first thing we had to do in the morning was to go through the camp. And we had to bring out any of the, anyone who died over the night. And and I was with a, we went in pairs. And there was one, one, one morning when I went out, and there was a, a young woman, and her, her two-year-old daughter had died, and she'd hidden the baby for uh, hidden the child under her black cloak for a couple of days, and the, and the rigor mortis had set in. We actually had to break the mother's arm to get the baby, the, the dead child, away from her. It was just <laughs> horrendous. Again, it's just an uh, it was just a like a, what they say is a lived experience that that affected me for the rest of my life. Of course, in, in this day and age, that um, there are um, and again, I'll come on to this very briefly. But we, we get to see it. We, we we become inured to this. You know, we see the the the, the, the horror and the, the heartbreak and the tragedy of people who were forced forced in for, forced migration out of their for, because of civil wars or whatever, and we, I think we become a bit newer to it, but um, it always takes me back to that life-changing experience that I had all those years ago. Um, another point that, uh, that that's made here. So I've, I've got a quote. I've got a quote here from Franklin Tillers. He was. He was the um, he's a president of Venn Tesol, and um, he made this very very powerful speech, and he gave a tremendous little case study of, of an example about how um, it wasn't good enough 
the, 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 the widespread view in his country and um, it's reflected in others was that their job was to um, the job was to like get students to listen and repeat and uh, and, in, and in this quote on the slides and I won't read it you can read it yourselves but uh, that we have to see ourselves as change agents and through through leadership and professionalism have to change how we how we view the notion of 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 our of our subject as as language teachers and again spoke very powerfully of justice uh, social justice equity and so on you've really seen some of the the best case scenarios and some of the more challenging case scenarios haven't you sure yeah it's, it's um, really hard yeah yeah if you live long enough and move move often enough <laughs> you do get to yeah. To, to rub up against and have, have these have these experiences. Diane, did you want remind to me, David, that you know when we categorize people, when we talk about them as immigrants or refugees or whatever, and we put them into a category, and there are reasons for categories, of course, but when we do it, we lose sight of the individual stories, uh, yeah. individual yeah. tragedies that we come in contact with. And I was just thinking as you were speaking that. That's why teachers can be so good advocates, right? They can be- yeah, Well, that's one of the points. I don't know if I skipped over it on the- Oh, sorry. Former slides, but one of the points that we met, came out strongly is that by the very nature of our, our work, and, and many of us do and have worked and taught in many different countries. And you know, most of my professional career has been in countries other than, I, have, you know, I did teach in Australia for a while with immigrants. I started out teaching immigrants and refugees. Vietnamese refugees, um, Iranian refugees, Chilean refugees, you know, just which reflected the uh, tremendous revolutions that were going on in those particular countries. Um, but yeah, the majority of my work has been done uh, in countries other in other countries. And so I've been very fortunate. Okay, let's move on. This one again, um, which one, as I said, Donald in, I, I took a quote from Donald and quoted him in, in my 2001 paper. Where he, he said that one of the things about our field is that we don't have an acknowledged disciplinary base with, with rules of the game. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing, to be honest with you. I think that, um, uh, and I don't think Donald would disagree with what I'm saying, but we have, um, we, I think we have some very rich research going on in different contexts, and and um, and so I don't I don't see that having have a having a diverse set of research procedures and and, and not having rules of the game um, or having different sets of rules of the game. I, I my my doctorate was a classic kind of psychometric study. Um, I did things backwards. Uh, when I did my master's degree in the UK, I did an eth ethnography. I did something you could never get away with these days because we didn't have ethics. So I went underground and posed as a, well, I what? I didn't, I wasn't really posing, but I went in and as a gormless little Antipodean chappy coming over to England, you know, to find out how to do it properly. But all the time I was, I was doing an ethnography at this school that was in, uh, was going through a process of comprehensivization. Grammar school and a comprehensive and a, a secondary modern school were put together um, into these comprehensive schools. And um, so I was looking at that and discovered that even though the campus looked to be a unified one, there were two different cultures and two different uh, sets of assumptions and so on going on within within the comprehensive school itself. But then, so then I went from there and did a uh, did a. Of psychometric study, so I don't, I don't see. To me, to me, um, the, the the procedures that you employ to do research really must really depend on what it is you want to find out. <clears throat> so, if you're proposing to investigate some kind of a relationship between variables of one kind or another, that that takes you in the direction of um, of, of of psychometric work. work. Um, but uh, one of the things that we did come up with, and I've, again, I've underlined this just to, just to draw it out, is 
from the summit was that what we need is more collaborative action-based research, looking at the problems, the, looking at the real issues that teachers face. And, and again, it, 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 one, that's one of the points that came up that a great deal of the research that is done in, in, in the academy address questions of interest to academics, but are of, of, of not, are of marginal uh, relevance to, to classroom teachers. Um, and so rather than, rather than being seen, and in a more recent paper, uh, Donald, and I'll show you the reference to this, to, to the source at the end of the session, um, the, the Donald makes this point that um, too much of research, see, teachers are seen as consumers of other people's research rather than as collaborators and um, an, an active, uh, um, active participants in collaborative action-based research. And I'll give a couple of examples of that when I get there, if I get there before I'm thrown out of this classroom. Okay, moving on. Or oh, any comments on that? You know, I wanted to comment on that, David. I hope you don't mind. We're not gonna get thrown out of the room, by the way. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. So, FYI on that. Um, so, you know, I, I'm really shocked because I'm doing a lot of undergraduate um, um, teacher education right now. And I'm really shocked by the fact that most teacher education programs don't have a research preparation component. Um, and, and if that research preparation component isn't part and parcel of teacher education, I think that does continue the um, differentiation of the research and, and teachers not engaging as, as closely unless they were they go on for their masters. And yeah. uh, it, it's something that strikes me as a, a real challenge for us. And um, I've been really thinking about how uh, TESOL has been um, supporting research more and trying to perpetuate that and wondering what kinds of ways do you think TESOL could, could uh, further support that? Well, I know at the convention, there used to be a research day, the day prior to the beginning, formal beginning of the, um, uh, of the convention, and I think it was, I think it was a paid event. Uh... David, you muted. I got muted. I didn't do anything. <laughs> a little screen came up, <laughs> and I couldn't read what it said because it flashed on and off. So. It, yeah, it was trying to shut me up, I think. Um, but uh, so we used to have that that research day. Um, there, were, there were also for doctoral students. There used to be. I don't know if they still have them. Um, Kate, when you were chair of the um, convention, I think you played a role in in developing those uh, those research workshops, where which which can be a bit tricky. You know, if you've got a, a doctoral students, doctoral students who are just beginning. The process and uh, you don't want to give them information that's going to conflict with their their, their advisor when they go back to uh, back to their home universities but um so and of course you know the research um the research intersection was made actually made a committee an ongoing committee of the board and so on and uh, but we did the board did have action and have action agendas which were updated every two or three years. I don't know, again, I don't know uh, if they still exist, but um, we'll see. Okay. A little bit of history there too, because when I came into the field, the TESOL was very rich with research. I mean, research, but even um, a practitioner research, uh, if I may say that, not, not the sort of SLA types, and I was there as a graduate student at the University of Michigan when there was a face-off between Jim Alatus and Robert Kaplan, because Robert mm -hmm. Kaplan was proposing to start an, an affiliate that of the International Association of Applied Linguistics and call it the American Association for Applied Linguistics. And Jim Alatus said, if you do that, the researchers will all leave TESOL and go to mm -hmm. Trail. Yeah, and, and some, of, some of our colleagues did that, you know. And I, many I, did, and many I did. Name, right. you, yeah, you know who they are, and I know who they yeah. are, but they, they said to me, well, I'm not, you know, I, I, I won't be going to TESOL anymore. You know, I'm going That's with right. the That's right, and I thought that was a, 
Wow. Yeah, it was quite prescient of him, but it was also a big loss. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. The point that I made to the colleagues who did have that attitude was, well, if you think you're going to go away to talk about yourselves, if you think the teachers are going to come flocking to you yeah. to learn how to do it, then think again. Right, right. But why, you know, at the point at the time, at the time, even even after Triple L had been established, but at that time there, there was still this interplay, and it, and it might be, you know, you'd have the so, you'd have the socio linguistics, they'd have their socio linguistics colloquia, you know, you'd have these different colloquia, but also informally, you know, you'd meet people, you'd get to talk to them over a beer or a coffee or whatever, sure, sure. Um, and a lot of that informal, to me, a lot of the most informal. The, the most valuable learning was, was this uh, this informal communication and conversation. Absolutely. I've just got to close some of these windows that are popping up, telling me. Um, yeah, this 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 again comes back to um, a point that I touched on earlier that the 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 global trends and the ones that that, that emerged. There's, no, there's nothing radical or new about that, but uh, massive shifts within countries and then between countries, knowledge explosion, inequity due to uneven economic development. And the anecdote that I told was to try and dramatise that it's not just inequity between first world and third world countries, but even within third world countries, there, there are privileged elites who are getting uh, advantages that... Um, uh, the, the most of the rest of the population don't have, and so that the access, access even within third world countries, is not e equitably distributed. But that um, as as people who teach and work in many different contexts around the world, we are in a position to act as change agents if we if we see that that is something that we that we should do. So that's I'd spend a little bit more time than I'd. Plan to do on on going through the uh, the action agenda from the TESOL summit, but I did think that it was important, and I think a lot of uh, one of the points, one of the things that I shouldn't feel a little bit regrettable is that for due to the, I guess I shouldn't be too undiplomatic here. Oh hell, why not? Due to due to political um, personality issues within within central office at the time, the Senate. The, 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 the summit and a lot of its outcomes were effectively effectively downgraded or, or buried. Um, the videos, for example, that were videos of the, of the plenary, and they're, they're quite short, you know, 15 minute presentations. Um, some of those were terrific and um, they've been either buried or I can't find them anymore or, or have disappeared from the, from the TESOL. Maybe our new executive director will resuscitate all of that. What do you think? Yeah, and well, you know, certainly Rosa when she was because because the, the the planning of the, uh, of the of the summit happened on, on her watch, and I don't know when she came back when she came back when uh, the her successor abruptly resigned and very generously came back. Um, whether whether anything much happened, but anyway. Let's move on. Um, I now wanted to give a number of examples of, um, if we can go to the next slide. So this is, a, communities of practice have been around for a very long time, but it's, it's becoming increasingly uh, of interest. And uh, it's, uh, uh, Wenger, is, Wenger is the person most, commonly associated with it. And she's been writing about it for many years with a number of, uh, of colleagues. But uh, basically she suggests that it's a group of people who share a common interest or passion for something. Uh, um, they want to learn or learn how to do it better um, as they interact regularly. One of my favorite communities of practice is the, my membership of the Hong Kong Wine Society. Um, and so they've, those of us who are interested in in fine wines and so on meet every every so often at um, the Four Seasons Hotel, and uh, and and it is a uh, an amazing learning experience because uh, many of the other members have, have forgotten more about wine than I've ever learned, 
that could have something to do with the amount of wine that I drink, but uh, that's another matter. So I want to give uh, another example, four examples of communities of practice, um, action research, peer observation, mentoring, and then language learning and use. And so if we go on to So I might be singing to the choir here or telling, telling people things that, uh, as I wasn't sure who was going to be turning up uh, for the presentation, I just wanted to uh, run through some of the characteristics of, um, of action research that, um, um, that I think differentiates it from other kinds of research. Although um, when I got, in, got involved in action research back in the 1980s and set up some action research networks among teachers, um, or facilitated teachers who were setting them up themselves. Um, a lot of people, and again, some of the folk that um, abandoned TESOL for uh, AAAL said, well, yes, action research is good professional development, but it's not proper research. And my answer was, well, it doesn't play by the, the, game, the rules of the game that you play. You know, you play basketball, but I'm playing, uh, I'm playing um, baseball. And we have different rules of the game, but it has all the characteristics of, of, of what we commonly conceive of as research of various kinds, some kind of problem or problem or puzzle, uh, questions, data analysis, interpretation and publication. And uh, when I was working as a mentor with, with teachers, they, they had no problem. They, they, they really enjoyed the whole process. Where, where things got a bit tricky was when it came to publication. Many of them didn't want and, and I made the point that publication means going public. It doesn't necessarily mean being published in a, in a referee journal, although it, it could be, but uh, just having an informal roundtable lunchtime discussion with, with, uh, with colleagues about some aspect of your own practice that you've been investigating is a form of, of research. And uh, why it's important in research is that uh, it makes it ma makes the activity um, it, it makes it amenable to scrutiny by others and, and criticism and critiquing by others. And of course, that's one of the reasons I think why teachers who are a little bit hesitant about, um, about uh, going public um, uh, quite a little bit about this. Many years ago, I, uh, at the Australian Applied Linguistics Association, I'd been doing some action research with a number of teachers and I organized a colloquium and um, they were very nervous about it, but they, they worked very hard and they did a very good job. And at the end of it, there was, one, there was a, a visiting overseas scholar who was one of the plenary speakers who stood up and absolutely tore to shreds what they had to say. Um, and uh, I mean, from a purely academic point of view, his points were not without their validity, but uh, they were so, so distraught at the end of it, they just said to me, well, thanks a lot. We're never gonna do that again. <laughs> Um, it begins with a problem or a puzzle that it can, that's contextualized in the, in, in the classroom. And so it's under the, under the control of, of the teacher. It's the teacher who decides, or the practitioner who decides um, what it is that they want to, they want to investigate, what, what, what the problem or issue is, is that they want to investigate. Um, and, it, and they're frequently and ideally collaborative. And certainly in terms of a community of practice, these, uh, even though in, there were some teachers who would be in, in, investigating a similar problem, say use of the ill way in the classroom or um, de developing a task, tasks in the classroom or integrating, maybe there, there were some of them who, who, were, who were looking at, um, at Diane's model and how that they could uh, experiment with that one in the classroom. Um, but they would, they would come together and um, uh, they would share the work, their work in progress. And um, once they'd completed a particular project, they'd then uh, share it more formally. Um, one, of, one of the things about action research is that it typically involves some kind of systematic change in the classroom. So you, you identify, <clears throat> identify a problem or issue, and then you develop an hypothesis about, well, what if I, what if I make this kind of a change? Um, and so one teacher, for example, was very, there were some number of teachers who were interested in 
um, the fact that they were doing too much talking in their classroom. They wanted the, the focus to be more on the learners than on them as teachers. And so I suggested to them that they record their lessons, several lessons, and then just put a clock, box, a timer on to see how much talking they, that they're doing and the kind of talking they're doing. And then look at strategies for uh, reducing the amount of talking they're doing. So they, they were deliberately trying to change to change some aspect of their teaching, um, and then um, look at the look at the effect. And of course, uh, in terms of the rules of the um, psychometric research game, um, it's one of the arguments is well, it's it it it, it it's not it's not external validity is a problem you can't extrapolate it to another situation and the response there is but yeah but if if, if you present it if in a particular forum you present your results other teachers it, it may have it, it may may have verisimilitude or, or credibility among other practitioners and they may work they'll then may want to um, explore in their own classrooms that particular idea any comments on this Okay, let's go on. Um, the next slide just just summarizes the uh, the steps in the process. Sorry, can I make a comment just quickly? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Just reading this, I don't know if you can see it. Educational researcher, it's put out by the AERA. Mm -hmm. Arrived in the mail today. And just one quick comment. The very first feature article in it is entitled "Both Questionable and Open Research Practices Are Prevalent in Educational Research," and it goes on about the questionable research practices of the so-called researchers with a capital R, you know, so, so to suggest that this kind of research that is formal, what do, you, what do you call it? Big R research. Big R research, yeah. You no, know, it is, is sanitized. It's not true. There are a lot of factors that, you know, do I get, do I get more subjects? How do I raise the, the yeah. statistics? probability of getting getting significance all of those kinds of things are very human oh, yeah I forgot so, so it's not that it's you know it's not done in a vacuum it's no. not so anyway sorry no that's that's a very important point because i forgot who who said it but a prominent researcher who said that the the published published academic research can from that point of view can be seen as as almost almost as fraudulent that, it, that the the final report is so sanitized, cleaned up, regularized yeah. all of the all of the messiness that went on, and again, as I said, when I did my PhD, this classic psychometric experiment, I, I was very kind of <laughs> disillusioned in many ways at the, the the number of compromises compromises that I had to make the 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 issues of cleaning stuff up. I remember having problems with some of the data analysis, and so my supervisor sent me to the professor of statistics. He said, "Oh, that's easy to solve here. You just use a different metric." And he said, "Yes, he exactly." Well, you, you know the whole, you know the whole controversy in psychology about replication, and yeah. when you repeat experiments, they don't get the same findings. And, um, yeah. and I mean, that's considerably across the field. It's not just a small sample. No, uh, no. And that's what they're saying in this article too. That the same yeah. is educational research. Right. So, so slide, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, no, that's that's all. I just want to make the point that yeah. you know, the critics have to look at themselves because they're they're as guilty as anybody, or maybe not guilty. I think they're just being human, is what it is. Mm -hmm. Accepting yeah. research, right? Yeah. I think we do set, tend to think of research when we're outside of it as as a, a straightforward process that doesn't have any difficult choices or a messiness, right? Yes. Um, yes. And and. I am not trying to plug anything here, um, folks, but um, this is one of the reasons why Keenan Dickelidis and I just put together an edited volume on researchers' narratives mm. um, to discuss, the, their, tell their stories of how they went about their research study in different paradigms um, and to kind of address those issues of, well, it is really messy. And, and when I was doing the, um, the index just the other day, um, the word messy kept coming up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> you know, and uh, it just really reminds you that this is a process by real people, not yes. researchers with a big R, right? Yes. And that when you're in the midst of it, sometimes you need somebody to vet these things against and ask questions to, and what would you do in this situation? And we don't often have that opportunity um, without professional organizations or co close colleagues who are, you know, engaged in that process as well. So I could see it would be off-putting for teachers K through 12 when they don't really have that kind of community around them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. The next slide, just very briefly, gives an idea of the kinds of the, the, the flavor of when when these very often I, I strongly encourage the um, uh, teachers to find somebody else who was who was interested in a similar area of activity, and you don't necessarily. And, and just become buddies as a way, peers, um, you might be looking at a slightly different aspect of, uh, of um, some aspect of your, of your practice. You, for example, um, the types of questions you ask, you know, um, whether, whether they're higher order question, higher order type questions versus, uh, you know, straight factual knowledge questions and so on and so forth, uh, display versus referential questions. Um, but to, to work together. And then, then we would have these round tables where you we'd, we'd get a whole collection of, uh, at one stage I, I was involved in a project uh, in Australia with, with the LOPE teachers languages other than English. And we had over a hundred teachers involved in it. And um, what we did there was to put about uh, 15 lead teachers, you know, who were, act, who were kind of teaching, but also acting in an advisory capacity within the, Lope community, and I, I worked with them as they did action research, and that was it's like a, they they then acted as mentors to uh, teachers who 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 were also interested and wanted to come in and uh, um, and and get advice and guidance, and so they had that practical knowledge as a result of having worked through the processes themselves. But on the next slide, Kate, um, <clears throat> so these are some of the things that. Uh, that we would we would end up discussing. I've, I've kind of cl cleaned these questions up, and because I, I turned it into a checklist eventually for uh, for other teachers, but but they'd em they'd emerged organically in the discussions that uh, that we used to have um, from time to time when we when we met up in these community of community communities of practice. Um, I, I I tend not I tend not to use the acronym because I think talking about COPS in relation to research is a bit problematic. So I'm going to stick to the clumsy title. Defund him, defund him. Yes. Here come the COPS. Um, yeah, so the, these are the kinds of, and again, you can see that these are, um, th these, these, are these are classroom teachers who are actually starting to pose um, fairly reasonably rigorous questions about the kinds of things that they uh, that, that they were doing in, in, in relation to their own practice. So there's a couple of examples on the next slide. One of them I shamelessly cited myself because it was the uh, it was an action research study that I did quite a few years ago. Now it was published initially published in, in T cell journal but then uh, was republished in a edited volume that Jack Richards and um, uh, Willie Renanda, Renanda uh, published um, in CUP, and I put put that version in there because it's probably if anybody wants to take a look at it, um, it it actually goes through all those steps and describes the steps and how it was done and what what was done and what what went wrong and what went right, and then a more recent one that. Um, this was an interesting study because it um, it was a collaborative study between uh, me as a university academic and also uh, Julie Choi, who's a senior lecturer at uh, Melbourne Graduate School of Education. And then we worked with uh, a woman called Hayley Black and her teacher. She teaches in a refugee centre in Melbourne, and she and she and her she and her um, her colleagues got very interested in, in this, note, this idea of action research. And so uh, we ended up, Julie and I ended up as their, as their mentors and uh, worked with them. And then we, we published the action research, but we also, we also did, a, did a, a paper looking at what the teachers had to say about how they felt that they were empowered through 
dissection research uh, processes that, that they're involved in, which I thought was was quite quite telling, because one of the one of the communities of practice that I worked with back in the eighties, one of the things that one group um, one group uh, reported was that there was a degree of suspicion on the part of their fellow teachers when they their fellow teachers knew they were doing research into their own practices and I said well maybe they're maybe they're just uh, maybe they're curious you know maybe be obvious be, tell them what you tell them what you're doing and why you're doing it and um, that in fact um, had a had a positive effect it wasn't that they were saying oh well you think you're too you're too good for us because you're doing research it was that they were just mystified and a bit mystified and a little bit curious um, the next uh, the next uh, example is um, peer observation, and so again, this this slide is very text heavy. But um, this was this was in a project that uh, a, a um, curriculum renewal project in a big uh, semongako in Tokyo called Kanda Gaido, um, and they were simultaneously revising their curriculum, and, and it was very much a, a within institution, they were, they were abandoning their uh, commercial textbooks, they were developing their own curricular and materials. And in, in addition, they were developing, they were adding a professional development dimension to what they were doing. And I talked them through a number of options and I said, well, there are things like developing your own professional portfolios, peer observation, um, action research and so on and so forth. And so uh, a number of them got in, developed the community community of practice around peer observation. And I've, again, I've outlined on the slide here, some of the, some of the steps that we went through. Um, and we developed, we, we developed principles of procedure, one of which was that um, you work in pairs, but when, when you, when you, when somebody observes your teaching, then you, it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street that you then observe, observe their teaching as well. And um, as we as we developed and refined the process, we looked at uh, we, several several issues emerged. For example, there are occasions when a, a teacher would come to me and say, "Look, I was observing I was observing Fred, um, and he did a certain number of things that I didn't think were were right, uh, not morally wrong, but uh, but what incorrect in terms of the procedures or in terms of the way he was interacting with with his students." And he said, "Well." I can't really tell him, you know, that will destroy the kind of trust that you need to develop in order for the peer observation to work successfully. And so we ended up, <clears throat> we ended up um, developing this non-judgmental process where the observer would give the, the observer would tell the teacher three things that they learned that they might want to try it in their own teaching and three things that they would do differently and would leave it at that. And, uh, and that's uh, and that that's that seemed to get over that that sort of problem, but um, that uh, that that project worked very well, and, and it um, it did it did um, lead to a great deal of of mutual collaboration and, and trust uh, between the, the the groups the group that was working on in that particular area. There was another group. There were, were another group of teachers who uh, worked together on developing their teaching portfolios, and another group working in action research, but the peer observation one was, uh, was one that, uh, that seemed to work quite well. Uh, other practical problems that came up, of course, was that it's quite time consuming, as you can see here, even sitting through an entire lesson. So uh, uh, some teachers discussed this and decided, well, that they'll, watch a, they'll watch a lesson segment and, and the teacher will nominate to the observer what aspects of their teaching they'd like uh, feedback on and so on. Okay, if there are no comments, we can move on. There's a, there's a reference on the next slide. This, this, this whole project is descri described in a book that I did with Clarice Lamb years ago called The Self-Directed Teacher. And um, we, we've, got a, we've got a chapter in there on uh, this particular project. And, uh, and, 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 and again, in that chapter, you needn't go back to the slide, in that chapter, we've got, we've, we've got some of the, the reports like, like we've, we've, we've taken two of the two of the teachers who uh, were prepared and happy to have us 
uh, have me actually publish their reports and their follow-up and then what happens. So it's kind of a case study. Uh, mentoring is another um, interesting um, aspect of professional practice. The quote that I've got at the top of the slide um, is taken from um, a book that I did with Kathy and Kathy Bailey and, and Andy Curtis called Pursuing Professional Development, The Self as Source. And again, the subtitle is really important because that's basically what all these community of practice uh, procedures, uh, it's an important element. But it, there's, a case, there's a case study where Kathy describes her, um, her professor at, when she was at UCLA, Russ Campbell, who became her mentor. And, she, and I, so I said, when Andy and I talked to her about it, we, we said, so what, what, would, what are the characteristics of a good mentor? And, um, and then Kathy said, well, he trusted me with responsibilities I didn't think I was up to. Um, and he was there ready to provide guidance to me. He opened doors for me, um, not just being polite, metaphorically, <laughs> or maybe Russell's a very polite gentleman, so he probably did open doors as well. Um, and he, sh he showed me how to get things done instead of just telling me. And he promoted my career uh, by telling others about my work. And he treated me as an intellectual equal, even though I lacked his experience and, and training. And again, the sample study here, again, um, my colleague and co-author co on a number of projects, Julie Choi, has just published a, a paper with one of her graduate students um, in the, uh, the Journal of Language Identity and Education, which some of you I'm sure would be familiar with. Uh, and they've called it knowledge building through collaboration, translation and translanguaging. And again, it's a nice example of where it, it displays all of those characteristics that, uh, that, that Kathy identified uh, in relation to Russ, that, uh, that they were colleagues, they were, they were, they were using, these, uh, using the, this di dialogic collaboration, but clearly Julie was more, was more expert than, than, than Kaylin, although Kaylin had, again, knowledge of her situation, her teaching situation, it was, she's in her second year of uh, teaching since graduating um, in, a, in a secondary school in Melbourne, um, but again, it, it dis displays all of the all of these qualities. And um, in another um, Zoom presentation that uh, that I did recently, um, I interviewed Kaylin and also one of her fellow um, fellow graduates, uh, and I talked to them about and. Uh, the session that I was doing was on, on um, it was called Research Matters and it was an uh, introduction to research, uh, which is part of the TERF um, speaker series. And so I embedded into my presentation part of the interview between um, Kaylin and Kat, her colleague, both of whom are actively got very excited about research and uh, during the course of their, their MA. I mean, a lot of teachers are not really interested in, in doing research, but to, but some of them are, and they're both now pursuing research. And I think both of them will end up going on and doing their PhDs and both, both of them are being mentored. So I picked out in this particular talk that I did, I picked out and uh, about a six minute segment when, when I, I said to them, what are the characteristics, tell me, tell, tell me about your mentors and what are the characteristics of a good mentor? And they mentioned these very points. And I said, okay, so your mentors do a lot for you, but, um, what do you what does your what do your mentors mentors get out of it <laughs> and they they they're a bit surprised about that and i said well you know it's not a two-way street and they said well you you're a mentor what do you get out of it and i said well to misquote uh, van morrison in one of his songs he said uh, um you keep me young while i grow old and i said you young people keep me young and you keep me in touch with the realities of your particular situation and the complexities and challenges and the enormous stress that uh, uh, career teachers at the beginning of their career have uh, these days. Um, Kate's disappeared again. I turned off my video. I think it's just putting too much stress on my computer. So I thought I would turn it off so we could make sure we, we can focus yeah. on you. Any, um, 
Diane, Richard, any observations on this whole mentoring notion? I know that you've been great, terrific mentors over the years. I particularly like your um, two-way street, uh, whatever metaphor or yeah. Uh, yeah. comparison. Uh, and I think that's really important. Um, in, when there's a, a, a perceived hierarchy of some sort, those who perceive themselves to be at the lesser status generally don't really have any, it just doesn't occur to them to think of the, of the other, the next step. And it isn't necessarily hierarchical up and good, up and down, good and bad, but it's often mm -hmm. perceived that way. And I think it's brilliant to bring that to the table of yeah. um, be, be aware that you're making a contribution as well as yeah. getting it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Diane. <laughs> I was just agreeing with Richard, I think, and David. I think that's right. It is a two-way street, and you learn so much. Yeah. It is about paying forward to some extent, too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. because, yeah. because we have invested so many years in this field, and I do feel like I want it to go forward. Um, and and so I feel, I mean, there's, a, there's the selfish part of me that wants, wants it to thrive. And if I do my little bit to make that happen, I want to. But it's a, it's certainly a two way street. I get a lot of pay back to myself while I'm paying forward yeah. to the yeah. field. Absolutely. Um, actually, one of my uh, long time ago students is present in this session, and to see her show up after we I'd taken her to a T cell conference way back in 2000 somewhere <laughs> yeah. it's it's pretty powerful to see that you know as the mentorship that went on hello michaela mm -hmm. <laughs> um has really you know paid off and yielded this wonderful um educator who's now working in new zealand um and you know it, it was a powerful thing that i was able to do with these students because the university created situations for that type of relationship building, right? Um, I was so disappointed later though, when um, that, you know, TESOL itself um, restricted undergraduate presentations um, at, at cert on certain forums like the Graduate Student Forum um, and uh, the Master's Student Forum, they didn't really have a place for undergraduate student researchers. And uh, that was a disappointment to me. It was really frustrating, but um, yeah. I just thought, thought I'd mention that I didn't appreciate the, the direction that TESOL took by restricting uh, students' access to pre presenting yeah. that sure. their research. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> I'll just go through this very briefly because we're getting out of time. This is, this is a study that focuses directly on communities of practice and it was it's published in um, uh, Chihiro Thompson's a professor of Japanese at the University of New South Wales. And so one of her uh, Japanese students, a mature age student who had lived and worked in Japan and had come back to, to study Japan, uh, Japanese at the university more formally and then um, got involved and, and, and got passionate about what he was doing, but then got involved, uh, brought in as a, as a teaching assistant, but then was treated, uh, Chihiro and her colleagues treated him not as, as Diane was saying, not as, you know, obviously someone where the expertise was not equally distributed, but treated him as a respectful colleague. And um, they then talk about, they described the project and um, uh, and then I've just put in this little quote that they said in the introduction to the to the to the vignette that this is a story about Peter, how he improved his Japanese proficiency, and developed his identity from that of language learner to that of language user, through because as again in their in in their staff meetings and so on when uh, they, they would be talking in Japanese and they would, they would help him with his Japanese, they would help him with uh, some of the tasks that he would do in the, in the uh, Japanese classroom with first year undergraduates and so on. Um, so, and then, so then they drew, draw, some, um, draw some conclusions about 
um, how, to, how these uh, communities of practice uh, develop and function. So on the last slide, I think it's the last slide, that, that's, that's the full reference in the, the book Jack and I did. So these are some observations that um, I pulled out of, and I could have used dozens and dozens of other examples, but obviously there was no time. Um, but the focus of a community of community of practice can be can be procedural, you know, can be the method, like for example, action research, participant, peer observation, and so on, or it can be substantive, for example, looking at translanguaging, um, where the focus where, where the where the group takes a particular issue and uses that as the as the unifying concept for their for their community community of practice discussions. Um, translanguaging, learning styles, task-based language teaching, and so on. Um, but then the other point that I make is that the, the, difference, the different types of community of practice are not, are not mutually exclu exclusive. Say, for example, the, the, the action research study that the Noonan, Black and uh, Choi, the, there, was, there, was, there was action research, there was mentoring, and there was peer observation. Okay, so you can have, you can have a range of these different um, procedural um, procedural processes. That's very, very bad English. <laughs> um, but um, also members of yeah, me members can be of different levels of expertise and knowledge, but the relationship must be marked by mutual respect. And then, as in, in addition to that, and this comes back to what we, what Diane was saying about. Um, and, and Richard was saying about um, when we're talking about mentoring, that all members will have different experiences, and therefore, but all members will have different experiences, but but also something something unique to contribute. The modes of opera interaction can be face to face, virtual, or blended. And obviously, given the the, the, the pressure of time and all the rest of it, uh, there are certain advantages in in online communities of practice, not, not the least of which is that you can, uh, they can be international. Um, and so uh, there are some papers that look at, uh, from, from within our field, I'll give you the reference on the next slide, um, that particularly online communities, they raise issues of social practice um, and so on. Here's the paid political advertisement. Well, actually, they haven't paid me. So it's, not, it's an unpaid political <laughs> advertisement for, 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 for Perth, um, but it does. It, pr practically all of the issues that I've mentioned in the course of this in the course of this uh, interactive presentation um, have resources on the Turf uh, website, and particularly the uh, uh, and the, the, the bibliographies. And I've just listed some of them here: action research, mentoring, and so on. And so. Uh, it's worth, I can't, I, I meant to count up the number of communities, the number of uh, uh, annotated bibliographies there. I don't know if Richard can remember, but there, there's a hell of a lot of them. Okay, look, um, finish up by looking at the, just a couple of the references that, um, so I, I've talked about uh, the little book that uh, Kathy, Andy and I did 20 years ago now. Um, and again, as I said, the, the reason why it's relevant, I don't know if it's still in print, but it should be. It's a, I still go back to it when I have to do a presentation at short notice and look for um, ideas and hints, but the notion of the self as source where it's the practitioner who's driving the process and who's central to the process. The edited book by Liz England has a whole section on communities of practice in TESOL teaching and teacher education. And so that one's worth a look at. Um, and the, the book by, I'll skip the next one, um, but the, the book by Daniel Cherry and um, the, um, his, his colleague um, called Re Research Literature Supporting uh, teaching, Teacher Research in English Language Teaching. Um, this has got a wealth of very practical short articles by a, a whole lot of people, many of whose names you know, Donald Freeman, I've mentioned his paper, his chapter in there, Anne Burns, I've got the one on teacher research and so on. Diane, do you have one in there? I'm not sure if you do. 
you should have. Um, but the other good thing is that it's freely downloadable. Um, and uh, so that means it's accessible, it's also free. And then this classic uh, reference to community sort of practice by, by Wenger. So the session went a lot longer than I anticipated. I'm delighted that uh, it did because it gave me the time to go into more detail in some of those slides than I thought that I'd have time so for. I don't know how many people have hung in there all this time, but- uh, Good great. number have hung in there, David. And Good. you know, I think it's such a treat for all of us to, to, to hear your thinking and to hear some other people chiming in and, and hearing their thinking and the interaction that's going on. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm grateful that all of you were willing to share your ideas. Uh, David, thank you for uh, sharing yours, of course. Um, and everyone, thank you for staying with us. Uh, even through the technological problems, and um, even though we ran over. Um, is there anything that anybody wants to ask here at the end? Maybe one or two questions before we leave. Of course, you can totally run because it is late in some places. <laughs> Could I just add one thing, Kate? <clears throat> There's an article that just came out in Teachers College, Columbia University publication this summer about six of my colleagues from the Graduate School for International Training celebrating their 30th year uh, of an inquiry group, a community of practice inquiry group was centered on their teaching and they've been doing it for 30 years and they've adopted a, a format that works for them. But wow. people are really committed to develop, developing themselves as teachers and supporting each other in doing the same. So somebody may want to check on that. It uh, came out in June, I think it was, through Teachers wow. Club. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That and David, really so nice, so nice to see you and hear you. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. your wisdom. Yes, absolutely. You know, I would like to see more consortia within TESOL for sharing our research and having support for the process. Um, you know, so we have people to run ideas by um, and I'm, I'm glad we have an, an intersection for research now. Um, the other thing is, is I've, I've, I want to respond to one comment you made earlier before we leave. Um, we need to raise the profile of the organization. And one of the ways I think we, sh we should be doing it is by having a speakers bureau where people um, have, can put up um, their information so other outside organizations come to TESOL looking for expertise. And it's something I keep proposing within TESOL whenever we're at open meetings, but somehow it doesn't ever seem to be picked up. But I think that's one way that we really need to be uh, putting ourselves out there to represent the organization in the field. And I didn't know if y'all wanted to comment on that idea. Well, I'd just say that, that that's one of the things that TERF is developing is a, is a speaking oh. <laughs> speakers bureau, and you don't have to be you don't have to be a member of the TERF board in order to you you more we're actively seeking um, people who would be interested in um, having uh, having a presentation, um, and um, there. The idea is that, um, well, there's this, the, the Turf Speakers series, but there's also a thing called Turf Talks, um, which is loosely based on the, um, the idea of having a fairly, uh, to, to have a, the way that it works is that you do a short three or four minute like um, Turf tip, which is a little kind of a, a promotional grab. Um, and then they're posted on the uh, the TERF website, and then uh, outside organisations can contact TERF and can say, "Well, we'd lo love to have uh, Kate Reynolds speaking on this, or Diane Larson Freeman speaking on that." <clears throat> then TERF acts as a broker, so you get a you get a fee from the organisation. <clears throat> TERF takes a modest cut, um, and so that's one initiative that would be not dissimilar from the sort of thing that you were proposing. Mm. Well, thank you. I'm glad to learn that. And I think a lot of other people will be too. <laughs> I wish they'd probably heard that earlier. <laughs> so, you know, like when you mentioned turf. So yeah, um, thank you so much for sharing everything with us, uh, David. We, we are so grateful for your, for, for your knowledge and your sharing and your time. Um, I appreciate you just riding the roller coaster of technology with me tonight. <laughs> <laughs>
But thank you, you for all... making make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> you all have a great day, night, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for attending. <laughs>